Sonic, the heart of your system. The Radeon 7 has been out for multiple days now and I'm actually producing this video on the 3rd of February so it could be that by the time this video is up that some things may be already changed. I'm not sure, I hope that some things change because as you've surely seen in my dry ice overclocking video the card really has potential when it comes to raw frequency on the core. So I think if we manage to get some proper cooling to the core and also to those hot spots, what we call the junction temperature, then I'm sure that we can also get some more performance and more frequency out of this baby. After achieving about 2100 MHz on the GPU core with dry ice at about minus 25 degrees Celsius, I'm sure that the card should be able to clock to like 1900 MHz using water cooling if we're also able to change the voltage of the core. Not necessarily increase the V-core, but on my card I could not even undervolt the core because whenever I touched undervolting, the card would crash immediately in the benchmark. The card was generally a bit unstable. I experienced a lot of unstable benchmark runs even with the card on stock. So today we're testing the card again with Unigine Heaven Superposition Benchmark, but we will test the card with Liquid Metal. Gamers Nexus already tried the card with Cryonaut and the results were so-so. We saw some benefits, but not extreme benefits. And I think with Liquid Metal there could be some more headroom in the card. Stock score in Superposition Benchmark with 4K preset is about 7,787 points. During the benchmark I'm monitoring all the data, I'm only measuring after 50% of the benchmark after the GPU is getting a little bit hot, monitoring data such as GPU temperature, junction temperature, fan speed and all of this and also monitoring the power consumption over a current clamp to make sure I don't have any mistakes in the results. The Radeon 7 features a quite massive triple fan cooler which we have to remove first. So first remove five screws from the backplate and after removing the backplate we can then access and also remove the rest of the screws which are keeping the card together and mounting the cooler. Four additional screws on a small backplate apply pressure to the GPU itself. Carefully removing the card from the cooler because I noticed that the cables are fairly short and we don't want to rip off any of the cables or the connectors from the card. After removing the GPU we can then see this graphite uh, thermal pad which Gamers Nexus already explained in detail. But what I find kind of amazing and also surprising is that this thing is not new. It has been on the market for a very long time and the first time I saw it on a public card was on the Asus R9 Strix Fury and Asus already used this thermal pad back in the days and I think this card has been out for three and a half or four years but as you can see on the pictures, those pictures are taken from Hardware Looks by the way, thanks for the pictures. So you can see that the terminal pad was already used there back in the days so it's really nothing new and nothing surprising in my eyes. It just has the big benefit, it's not like a terminal paste so it cannot harden over time, it's already hard, it's already a terminal pad so you will not lose performance over time which is surely a big benefit over a conventional thermal paste. The big downside is of course if you remove it you can see it ripped apart in my case I have two small pieces stuck on the edge of the HBM2 and I also have a lot of small pieces stuck on the GPU and also on the other two HBM chips on the right. Turned out that it's also quite difficult to remove those residues from this thermal pad because it's really, it's like a sticky thermal pad, it's not like a normal thermal pad that you can just peel off or remove easily. I had to use some cleaning alcohol to remove the residues of the thermal pad and it really took some effort and a lot of wipes across the GPU to remove all the residues from the pad. 
After removal of the terminal pad, we can see the beautiful GPU and the four HBM2 chips that are surrounding the GPU. And I also found that there is no height difference on my card, so there should not be any issue to use liquid metal on the GPU and also on the HBM, as we've seen it previously on the Vega 64, for example, where we had two different packages where some cards had height differences between the dice. Of course, because we're using liquid metal, we're also protecting all the SMDs that are surrounding the GPU. As usual, I'm just using normal nail polish to protect all the SMDs that are surrounding the GPU to prevent any kind of short circuits. For me it was even more difficult to remove the rest of the pad from the cooler part because it's just so extremely sticky that I decided to use a razor blade and basically cut it off the cooler. If we take a closer look we can really see all those small pieces that reflect like graphite. It almost looks like a bit like a pencil tip. So you can be sure that this is some kind of a graphite thermal pad. Same as on the GPU, we are also removing all the residues here with some cleaning alcohol. After about 20 minutes, the nail polish is dry and we can start with the liquid metal application. In this case, I'm using a little bit more liquid metal than I usually do because I was not sure how big the gap is between the GPU, the HBM and the cooler. As I said before, there is no height difference between the GPU and the HBM. That's not a problem, but I was afraid that the gap between the cooler and the die in the HBM would be too big because the original dimensions are made for this graphite tunnel pad and I would assume that the thickness is something like 0.3 millimeters, maybe 0.2 millimeters and therefore the gap is quite a lot bigger than using liquid metal and I wanted to be sure that there is proper contact between GPU and the cooler so I used a little bit more liquid metal than usual so I have a proper gap filling. Then of course also applying the liquid metal on the cooler itself to break the surface tension of the liquid metal and make sure it has proper contact. Then it's time to remount the cooler, so don't forget to plug the fan connector and also the connector for the radio and LED inside the cooler. Start with the GPU backplate and then add all the other screws. After remount I did a quick test in GPU-C with the render test and just checked the temperature in the Wattman to see if there is proper contact between GPU, HBM and the cooler but it looked very good. So then I performed again a superposition unit in heaven benchmark run with the 4K preset similar as what we did for the start where we had 7787 points stock and now we have 7847 points or 48 points and it's only a small difference, but there seems to be a difference from applying a liquid metal. Again, I'm taking the data only from the second half of the benchmark run once the card is really hot and once the data and the temperature values stay consistent. So comparing stock versus liquid metal, superposition 4K preset, at stock we had 7787 points and liquid metal increased it to 7848 points. It's only 
a very small increase in performance. I noticed that minimum GPU clock increased from 1709 MHz to 1733 MHz, so I guess that's where we get the additional, I don't know, 1% performance from. It's only a very small performance boost. Maximum GPU clock boost stayed the same, so, so from 1780 to 1779, it's not really worth mentioning anything here. Maximum GPU temperature stayed the same at 73 degrees Celsius, which makes sense because obviously it's a temperature controlled fan which we notice if we check the fan speed on stock it was 2940 rpm max and liquid metal is 2900 rpm fan speed so there was a very small decrease in fan speed and therefore it should also decrease the sound level of your gpu a little bit what i noticed is that the hotspot or the max junction temperature decreased by five degrees celsius from 106 to 101 so that's surely a good thing but overall i would say it's not really worth applying liquid metal on the stock cooler for now I then thought, okay, maybe let's simulate higher fan speed, therefore maybe a custom card with a better cooling solution, which we can do by just increasing the fan speed. I rerun the benchmark again at 4K preset and figured out that the performance did not increase, which was kind of strange. And I'm not sure if we again have some driver issues here, because typically if we increase fan speed, if we lower temperature then we should get a higher boost which we did not get in this case so overall i would say it's really not worth the hassle of removing this thermal pad for now because also keeping in mind that this thermal pad would have extremely consistent temperature values over years probably because it just simply cannot dry out so it's probably worth just keeping the stock thermal pad on the cart Overall, if you're considering to get the Radeon 7, I would personally maybe wait another three or four weeks. Maybe the price drops a little bit and maybe AMD also finds time to tune the drivers a little bit and we can maybe get a better overclock and maybe also a bit more consistent values and also more stable values.